bà chấm điểm số tu được test chân chỉ tìm mệt rầy bà sâu xóa cốt mà càng cam mệt thì chụp chụp chấm môi được khi ông thôi ní được lười cần chọn thu được khai tivi bà ngày ní dương miền sạch đây xong rồi đi đi dạng khăng đại miền cồn khai dương mồi rúp miền tiệp của so dạng cổ hay bàn riêng chọp đò thân nặng sẽ nhà bạc cổ hay đừng thui ca còn nâu cần lại chấm môi đừng xuống on trả chết khang ở dưới hay khang ở mấy khang ở dưới US Asian hay thằng này đi chơi miền sạch đây sau đó đi đi chơi khăng đây là đường bọc chuột chơi môi đường Vanery cũng hay Vanery miền cá đỏ bị sọt làm cho nắm thôi cá chơi môi đường actually I'm going to read in English Vanery has five years of experience working with multilateral organization She is the C20 delegate and United Nations Youth Ambassador to Manta Sailing Center, where she advocates for indigenous rights and environmental preservation through water sports. She is the founder and president of U.S. Asian Youth Council, amplifying youth voices and engage an engagement between the United States and the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. Wanderi is also the co-founder and vice president of the world is watching BLM. BLM, I believe, is a Black Lives Matter, an international global coalition of leaders advocating for black lives worldwide. She served as a consultant for the United Nations 75 anniversary, providing guidance and solution to overcoming systematic racism and homeless in progressions to the sustainable development goal. Vanity served as the 2019 US Youth Delegate to the G20 Summit and presented its community, community at the UN High Level Political Forum, advocating for intellectual property, protecting and economic development with small to medium sized enterprises to compete in the global market. <laughs> wow, Vanity, uh, welcome to the program. This is like a, a big. Um, it seems like everything is all high level for me here that I never seen before. <laughs> your title, your, your, your work. <laughs> yeah. So uh, welcome to the program. So first, I would like you to kind of like uh, tell me a little bit about your history. I mean, where are you born and uh, what what you do in your college or high school? Sure. So. Um... I was actually born in Fresno, California, um, but I was raised in Indianapolis, Indiana. Uh, my mom is Khmer, my dad is African American, so I grew up in a very mixed race background. When I was really young, my parents ended up getting divorced, so my stepfather is also African American, but my stepmother is Mexican, but she's from the Yucatan um, tribe in Mexico. Um, so I grew up with a very um, international background, despite being from <laughs> Indiana. Um, growing up, I had a typical childhood. Uh, my mom ended up converting over to being Catholic. We would still go to temple for Khmer New Year in Pachum Phen, but she definitely made sure I was raised in the Khmer culture. Um, and then my father, he works for a government contractor called Rolls Royce. So definitely lived in suburbia, played sports growing up. I played basketball, volleyball, ran track. I played tennis. I was also very involved in academics. I was on the debate team, one second in state in high school, National Honor Society. Um, uh, for my undergrad, I went to Indiana University where I majored in political science and international affairs. So I studied, I studied Mandarin um, and I also studied um, U.S. Um, Asia Pacific relations in regards to international trade and economics and figuring out how do we build up the third world countries such as Sort Khmer, Thailand, Laos, Bur uh, Burma, um, Indonesia countries um, like that. Um, I inter ended up interning at the United Nations Economic and Social Affairs in New York City. Um, I've also done education reform as an intern for the Indiana government, um, just making sure that there were more um, opportunities for lower income families to be able to 
go to school. Um, my very first internship actually was with um, the Catholic Relief Services, the same agency that brought my family here to um, the U.S. Um, during the uh, Kamai Krohom. So it was, um, I actually taught English to refugee families as well. Um, I definitely have a lot of experience as well. Um, one of my last internships that I absolutely loved is that um, I interned at the International Center where we worked with Chinese businessmen where we increased U.S.-China relations in the private sector. Um, so I currently am a graduate student at Harvard University where I um, study cybersecurity um, and international affairs. And right now I'm working at a firm called Granicus where we focus on federal compliance and providing digital technologies to government and making sure that we're providing secure um, safety um, against threat, um, against threats from foreign countries and making sure that the information that needs to be given out to citizens um, has done. Um, some projects that I'm working on as well. So I'm also currently out here in DC. So, um, uh, like you mentioned, Butoni, that I am one of the vice president of the World is Watching. So right now we provide resources to um, the international Black Lives Movement as well as here in the United States, whether it's mental health, whether it's providing resources for protesters to protest safely, um, more of the academia side too, if there are students that want to do like a research thesis on the internet internationalization of the Black Lives Matter movement, providing gateways to do so. As far as the U.S. ASEAN um, Youth Council, which I founded um, three, about three months ago, we actually um, engage a lot with the ASEAN countries. Um, right now we're in talks with their organization, the ASEAN Youth Organization, and we're building out pipeline with the United Nations major group of children and youth, creating platforms for youth to get more involved. And we're also going to be starting mm -hmm. uh, a study abroad program to getting more U.S. students to intern in Southeast Asia and to work into for more educational opportunities. Um, as well as making sure that more U.S. businesses are, are getting that pipeline from the United States. So that's a little bit about my background. Wow, that's a lot. <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, let me ask you a little bit. It seems like you, your, your mom is uh, is Khmer and your father is 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 black, or African American, and then you have a stepfather, right? As mm -hmm. a Yucatan. No, he's he's um, Kamau too. He's African American. Oh, he's African American also. <laughs> I, I, mom. Oh, stop, mom. It's Yucatan, yeah. Oh, Yucatan is there? Is that in Yucatan? Is that in Mexico somewhere, right? Yes, correct. Yes, it's in Mexico. So during all of these transition, uh, trans uh, transition, do you kind of like uh, move around, or you just stay in one place all the time? Um, so my mom ended up um, raising me with my stepfather. So my dad would come to Indianapolis with my stepmom. So that's where I would see um, then my little sister. But um, what inspired me to go into international affairs was actually my grandfather. Uh, when in Phnom Penh, he actually worked for the U.S. Embassy when Long Nol, under the Long Nol administration, he was running Cambodia, he handled their finances. So growing up, my grandfather used to tell me stories about Cambodian, about Cambodian politics and Southeast Asian affairs, and then just being exposed to all different cultures growing up. That's what ended up kind of pushing me forward. I see, I see. So basically, you seem like you have some kind of a background from your ancestry uh, in, in the politics and stuff like that. So that's why you mm -hmm. take political science at school, right? Yes. So you, so it seems like you were really, uh, really smart when you were in high school. You got um, honors, second place or something in high school in Illinois, yes. right? Oh, uh, no, in Indianapolis. Oh, in Indianapolis, I'm sorry, yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, I was on the debate team. So we were, um, we were, I would do competitions outside of playing sports on just different topics. Um, I think at that time we were debating on if children who, co who committed a heinous crime under the age of 18, if they should be tried as adults. So it was more like a mock trial, but we were competing against like very, very um, prestigious private schools. Um, at the time I was going to a public um, school for high school, but 
yeah, that, I think that's what initially started kind of my love for research and data analysis and putting it into real world perspectives. Um, let, let me ask you this. I think this is probably something that a lot of people might, might, might want to ask. Uh, some people might say, well, she probably be born smart. That's why she's smart. So does it really true that you born smart or you have to work hard to be smart? I think it's both. I think we're every day we're constantly learning something new. We have more opportunities to room and grow. And I think that everyone definitely has the potential to be smart. It's, you know, you have to be in the right environment and you have to want it. You have to have that hunger to want knowledge. Yeah. So I guess so I guess you're absolutely right. You have to be hungry for that. If you don't hungry, if you don't work hard, you cannot be smart, right? So when you work yeah. hard, you get smart because that's how it go. If you expected uh, everything to come to you by itself, that's not, probably not going to happen. So going mm -hmm. through college, you're going to start in Indianapolis over there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so... Um yeah, so I did my undergrad at Indiana University, Indianapolis, and I go to Harvard now, but I'm currently in D.C. So I work um, for a cybersecurity firm, and then they re they basically pay for my tuition at Harvard. So it's like a reimbursement program. At Harvard right now is for what, for the uh, master degree or for a doctor yeah. degree? It's master's, yes. Oh, master's for master's degree. Mm -hmm. Uh, the cybersecurity company actually paying for your school to go to Harvard, and they're the one who sponsor you to go there, right? Yes. Is that difficult to get into Harvard, or is like, for example, let's say some college student right now, they say they want to go to Harvard. I mean, what do they have to do? Is there anything they need help with from a company or from somebody? Um. So, um. I think it just depends on where, what you want to study because there's so many different um, programs for me personally. I um, What I did was I actually ended up talking to a lot of the recruiters. Um, from there, I took my GRE score. I had my letters of recommendation. I had a personal statement. And, um, but I was very specific with my goals and what I wanted to do and where I wanted to take my career and who I wanted to study under. Uh, and then once I turned it in, you know, I got accepted in and that was pretty much it. But um, as far as ways of paying into school, obviously, you know, there's scholarships, there's loans and Harvard's pretty good about scholarships. I mean, I have one as well, but for the remaining of my tuition, I just, uh, I personally wanted to work while going, um, pursuing a master's just because it's, um, it's just easier once you graduate, you're able to get a job quicker. Whereas if you were to be a, um, a grad student and just be full time and then graduate, it'll be harder for you a little bit to um, get a full time job just because they're one, once you're coming out of your master's program, they're wanting that five to seven years of work experience. Um, I think we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, I'm going to go back to uh, more university because I think there's a lot of students out there, there's a lot of college kids out there that they will probably want to go there. So we're going to take a quick break and then we'll be coming back, okay? So become a T, some of the plants and map. Uh, so so control, win, but welcome back. Um, Vanity, I have a question, which is probably a lot of the kids say, you do really well at school, at, in college. I mean, like you get uh, babies four point or whatever it is there, but the the family is poor, like don't have a lot of money that would can afford uh, Harvard. What, what do they have to do to get into Harvard or do they have to go find a job first? Get a, like a, get into a firm and get a firm to sponsor, or what do they have to do to get into Harvard? I mean, how difficult it is. Um, yeah, so paying for graduate school is definitely um, a challenge. Unfortunately, I mean, my parents paid for my um, my undergraduate degree, but unfortunately, but fortunately, um, I 
um, wanted to come up with some ways that I could pay for grad school because I knew it was very important to my career. So yes, that is definitely one way you can definitely find like a job. Most jobs have um, reimbursements for you to go to grad school. So that's always one option. Another option is there's so much like research fellowships out there. Um, I definitely had a couple of research fellowships that definitely came in. Um, and they're like, you basically you participate in a year and then you, um, and then you, obviously you send it in um, and then send it into your research. And that's another way where you can pay for school. And then there's also loans. Uh, then there's also just the regular traditional scholarships where you just write in, you know, an essay or you send a video in and then you can get money sent to your bursar's account. So, uh, so is this your second year or your first year? So I'm actually because I am working full time. Um, this is my um, this is my second year being in grad school, but I've been taking classes like one class every semester just because I'm working full time. I see. So it's part time. So it'll be a few years before you get your master's degree. Um, yeah. I want to go back a little bit to U.S. Uh, what is U.S. Asian Youth? Uh, yeah. Yes. What is Asian Council? So um, I guess I'll start from the beginning. So the Association of Southeast Asian Nations was established on August 8th in 1967 by um, in Bangkok, Thailand. And uh, the original members of the countries were Indonesia, Malaysia, the Philippines, Singapore, and Thailand, and um, Brunei. Um, Brunei ended up joining um, in, uh, 19, in 1984 and then Vietnam joined in um, 1995. And then of course um, every all the other countries start trickling in. Um, Cambodia actually joined the trade the trade agreement in about the late um, 90s but it was um, Basically, the ASEAN was founded with some key pillars with mutual respect for independence, sovereignty, equality, um, territor territorial integrity, and the national identity of all nations. Um, it was basically established, too, for um, countries not to interfere with their own internal affairs of one another and um, to basically increase uh, more peaceful interactions with each other when there, um, if there was a dispute and um, to create cooperation amongst um, themselves. So the reason why ASEAN plays such a critical role in the United States is that they have the fourth largest GDP in the world right now and that is after um, it's actually right after the European Union. Um, they have one of the largest emerging markets economically. And so there's a lot of countries are investing interests in the ASEAN region, such as China and Russia. And you see China's investment with the Belt and Road Initiative, which is why there's a lot of Chinese influence in the Southeast Asian region. And so my purpose was for starting the US ASEAN Youth Council was started for several reasons. For one, I wanted to encourage whether they're Khmer or of Southeast Asian descent to get reinvested into taking pride for being Southeast Asian. And then the second reason was to help uh, small businesses that are of Southeast Asian descent to get more um, resources, whether they need more financial loans, whether they need more resources, a mentorship, or just emergency funding. And as someone who works in cybersecurity, the Small Business Administration who administers these loans is actually one of our clients. And so I see resources all the time that a lot of these small businesses that you'll see at the temples can definitely use. So it's like, how do we bring these resources to the businesses that they need the most? Um, and then obviously just redirecting um, the engagement back to Southeast Asia. So even at the political level, there is diversity initiatives to get more African-Americans and diverse candidates interested in the Asia Pacific. And because I see so many um, opportunities that would be great for many Cambodian Americans. I thought it'd be great, a great opportunity to start this youth council to basically reignite that interest as we are, are also recovering from the Khmer Rouge War. So basically, you kind of like maybe exposes the small business in uh, Southeast Asia to the U.S. and maybe vice versa. How many members do you have right now as a youth? So um, just a regular membership or just people that are involved with the organization? People that are involved with the organization. 
So right now we actually have about 40 people that are um, involved internally with the organization, but we do have a few partners. So one of our partners is obviously the United Nations. We work really closely with the United Nations major group of children and youth, um, the International Association of Political Science Students, the Young Diplomats of Canada. Um, the Canada ASEAN uh, Youth Council is actually just going to be starting too. We just formed our um, partnership with the ASEAN they're the very first ASEAN youth organization that's connected to ASEAN generally. Um, we are going to start working with the American Cambodian Chamber of Commerce as well. And then we um, so far have worked really closely with the Saudi Arabian government. Are, are those 40 uh, people there that helping in the organization, are they all mixed, you know, from all Asian, like Cambodian, Thai, Brunei, all of those? or? Yeah. So half of them are of Southeast Asian descent. The other half are just their careers are involved with Southeast Asian affairs. So they just wanted to bring their expertise in to the organization. So do you also have a member? You said is there a membership that they have they can join or something? Yes, we do. So um, our membership is uh, definitely constantly growing. So right now we have a. We have about, um, if you include like our student organizations, it's about it's about 70 people. Um, we're still we're still um, growing and creating those processes. We'll be rolling out a newsletter soon, and we definitely have a lot more programming that we're going to do. Because, like I said, we're also going to provide that um, that career interest as well, and kind of exposing it in, in a culture sense. So we're going to start having a lot more programming and reaching out to our partners overseas for those collaborations. The, the membership is basically is just for ASEAN only, right? Not for any other ethnicity? Oh, no. We, no, we welcome anyone. Um, what's interesting about the U.S. ASEAN Youth Council is that we actually partner with different regions of the world. So um, we actually partner with the African Congress and the African Union with their youth organizations. We partner with the Australians and the New Zealand and the Pacific Islands. As well, we're actually going to be co-sponsoring a conference with them early next year. And then we're also working with the CELEC region, which is the Caribbean um, and the South American countries as well um, for some hackathons, which are basically um, competitions where you can create an app or any digital content to solve like one of the world's most pressing issues. But yeah, we definitely, um, you don't have to be Southeast Asian to join. We definitely are a very inclusive group. <laughs> That's good. So, what are the what are the benefits for the membership? So yeah, we definitely have a lot of benefits. So for one, you can get um, some you can get mentorship. Whether um, we do have a college college readiness program, so we do help with resumes and if you need to submit your cover statement. Um, and then there's volunteer opportunities as well. So if you want to volunteer at a, um, a local homeless shelter or tutor um, children, um, children to get um, get into high schools and get to college. And then we also are hosting a lot of career fairs as well. So if you're interested in looking for a job in Southeast Asia or here in the U.S. Um, or any internships, we're going to be hosting that as well. And it's a great networking opportunity. We definitely want to create that impact as well. So we're going to have some study abroad programs. So for those that may not have been to Southeast Asia for the first time, we're actually going to plan some trips as well so they can like see Southeast Asia for themselves. Um, but those are the few benefits that we have. That, that's good. How, let's say if somebody wants to join, what is your website there? So our website is called the US ASEAN Youth Council.org and all it takes is you scroll down to the bottom of the page, hit contact, put your name, first and last name and your email address and then you're automatically enrolled into our system. Well, typically, yeah. So in the international affairs world, youth is um, defined as someone from 18 to 39. But my uh, my role is kind of like going back to what you asked before, Butoni, is that whether you're born smart or if you have to work hard, we're always learning something. So we're always asking for expertise. And we actually encourage a lot of the elders to kind of join in because they can kind of serve as mentors. And for those that are help, helping with business, who have businesses as well, we would just love to provide opportunities to maybe get some of our Southeast Asian youth involved in helping these businesses out as well for internships or media purposes. 
that sounds good. I may have to join that too because that's free special <laughs> Friday. <laughs> We're going to take another quick break. And uh, when we come back, I want to talk more about um, the G20 summit and stuff like that. was a G20 delegate. Yeah, G20 delegate. So we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to continue with you, Valerie. Thank you. Okay, so welcome back. Um, you also is a delegate of the G20 uh, to the United Nations. Can you tell me a little bit about that, please? Great, yeah. So I'll actually explain what the G20 is because I know it can be quite confusing. But the G20 is basically just an actual international summit for um, governments and cent uh, central banks um, from the 19 different countries in the European Union. Um, the aim was basically to um, was related to like the financial markets. Um, so most most of the times, like the heads of governments come and discuss these issues in regards to international um, finance. Um, so every and then there's also different engagement groups. So um, the different engagement groups are, are civil society 20, which are basically not for profits or um, civil societies like what they are. Um, and then there's youth 20, which are like the up and coming like youth leaders of the countries that were promoted by the governments. There's think tanks 20s, which are basically research firms, um, governors 20, um, I'm sorry, not governors 20, uh, mayors 20, and then there's also business 20. But the G20 countries that are involved are Australia, Canada, Saudi Arabia, the United States, India, Russia, South Africa, Turkey, Argentina, Brazil, Mexico, France, Germany, Italy, the United Kingdom, China, Indonesia, Japan, and South um, Korea. Um, so I actually got involved with the G20 summits last year. I was chosen by the White House and the Department of State to represent the United States and Japan. Um, and I was advocating on behalf of, in, uh, of international trade and um, in terms of businesses. So I was advocating for intellectual property protection, um, basically in terms of the US-China trade war that occurred. Um, a little bit this year and also really heavy last year was um, certain countries were stealing information from U.S. businesses and stealing revenue from the U.S. So I was advocating to protect those funds and to keep that money generating on the U.S. side. So um, and from there, I got to um, present our final negotiations with the G20 countries in the European Union at the United Nations High Level Political Forum with the World Bank and the and the Saudi Arabian government at the time. Um, this year, I was still involved with Y20, but as an alumni, I was selected as um, in their first cohort for their dialogue fellows, um, where we talked about the impacts of um, COVID-19 on youth and mental health and to how to get more youth engaged in the international platforms. On the, on the C20 side for Civil Society 20, we um, encourage the G20 countries, particularly the government of Saudi Arabia, to invest more into the communities to provide more resources for families and students to go to school and to get jobs in terms of living in a digital world. Wow, seems like you've done a lot. Are those your part-time job or something? Because you said you have your job at the cyber cybersecurity firm here. Mm -hmm. So the all of the other stuff, and you also that, that's not all. There's something other. You do just use ambassador to Manta Sailing Center. So it's yeah, like yeah. those are all uh, yeah, those are all uh, volunteer work or something. Yes, though. Yeah, there are basically part time jobs. So I basically work from nine to five and then I do my classes F, um, in between. And then basically anything else I have time for, I just fit. I have a really, really busy schedule. Wow. No wonder. No wonder you are. It took what, two, three months before we had a chance to talk to you. I think I think it's a it's a good, busy life. You know, the, because you learn a lot, you meet a lot of people, you meet a lot of uh, uh, leaders around the world, I believe. Because do you attend the G20 meeting also, or you do? Yes, we do. 
Yeah, so you probably meet a lot of different uh, leaders from around the world, right? Yes, um, we actually got to meet the Prime Minister of Japan and his wife last year. We got to work really closely with Japan's Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And this year we worked really closely with uh, Saudi and their uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs as well. And next year G20 will be hosted by Italy. So next year we'll be attending Italy. Uh, oh, so the, where it's going to be next year? It's going to be in Italy? Yes. I think this year was, is it virtual or uh, um, in person? So, yeah, so this year it was, it was half virtual. So Saudi still had its main conference, but it, we all had to call in just due to the travel restrictions. But yeah, it was mostly virtual this year, but we still got to participate fully with our negotiations. And then we had to come out with some um, research proposals and figuring out how to implement our, our um, policy proposals into the community. Wow, it seems like you're very, very busy from full-time job plus uh, study and also part-time job. And those part-time jobs, I guess you're not getting paid, right, to do all of those uh, volunteer work, I guess, the uh, ambassador um, or delegate or something like that? No, typically um, for someone that's involved with the G20 um, summit, it's more of these types of roles will get you into the higher level positions. In the government and eventually i will transfer over and work for the u.s federal government i um we'll just see where it goes um later on down the road as i while i finish school uh, but i think it's it's very good to to become familiar with it now so that when the times come you already know what it is because if you are not you're not in that field or you're not in that game so when the time come, you wouldn't be able to identify or know anything, right? So you seems right. like you already have some politic background, and you're going to be all in the politic background, and then you 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 are on the right track. Basically, you you set you set your path, you set yourself, which is very very good. And I think that is also a really really good example for I think for a viewer out there that if if you want to do something in that field for example it doesn't matter is politics or economic or um uh, business person or whatever you got to start in that field you got to become familiar with that it doesn't matter how you make money or not but you have the experience you know the people and when you are there you are you are you are you are ready it's just like you you are delegate to the g20 summit g20 summit has a 20 different uh, leaders from around the world coming to meet mm -hmm. somewhere and you know them basically once you see them next time you know them so you have a chance to communicate with them where other people have no chance right <laughs> for example if i want to talk to somebody one of the g summit forget it <laughs> who are you right but for you no problem you can get in there because you have the the opportunity so i think it's a really really good example so far what you've done and see you seems very very busy also uh with your life i guess from the from the young until now it seems like very busy from the way you talk because it doesn't seem like you have any time left to do anything else other than uh work study and then work again <laughs> do you take vacation oh. sometimes <laughs> oh i did um the last vacation i went on, i went to sorokamai last year went to Phnom Penh. Really? so yeah i went for my birthday so I went to go see um, Angkor Wat and I went to go see um, Phnom Penh for the first time, so. For the first time in your life since you were born? Mm-hmm. Wow. So how, how do you like it when you get back to Cambodia and see all of those uh, different things there? I didn't want to leave, honestly. I loved it in Cambodia. I mean, there was, I mean, there was a lot, I mean, it's a developing country, so there was a, a lot of poverty. Um, you know, and then, you know, it's it's interesting to see um, how much influence that China has over Cambodia. And I know just recently that China Cambodia just came out with a free trade agreement as well. So China's going to get some more influence over Cambodia. So it was kind of disheartening to see a little bit to how the culture is shifting and how um, when you go to like a lot of the monuments, like the killing fields, how there's big apartments being built 
and they're the, literally the same rent that you see here in the US and you're thinking, there's no way someone's going to afford $2,500 in rent in Cambodia. Why, why is that here? Um, and what's also interesting is um, ASEAN has a really big influence in Cambodia, but um, that's the other reason why I wanted to start the Youth Council is because I wanted to inform the Southeast Asian community of what ASEAN is, because you're only going to know what ASEAN is, is if you're in politics. And there is a lot of projects that ASEAN does that I think a lot of, especially in our community, a lot of Kamadis should know about because they're all about education and investment. So um, I'm not too sure if they're going to be building schools this year, but I do believe that that's something that probably 10 year, years later down the road that we'll be exploring as well. You know, I, I was wondering, uh, I, I'm pretty sure you know what NATO is. I'm wondering if Asian probably going to set something up like that so that way that's what in the future. Did. Yeah, they did? Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's what, that's what ASEAN is. ASEAN is the Southeast Asian version of NATO. Oh, okay. So, they, they, well, because, you know, the, the, the problem with uh, the um, in Asia is also is about the border, the border. There's always, mm -hmm. there's always an issues like that, you know, it's like China, India, uh, Vietnam, Cambodia, Thailand, all of those countries mm -hmm. are always having issues with borders and stuff like that. So if uh, the problem that I'm, I'm, I'm trying to say is here is that if we have some something similar like NATO, instead of fighting, we talk, we resolve the issue, we go by the principle, we go by the paper, we go by the law and the contract and everything else. So that way we can uh, resolve the, the, the problem instead of fighting where it happened like now, you know, in uh, Azerbaijan and Armenia, they're fighting, there's a lot of people die for nothing, you know? <laughs> so if they have something like that right now, setting up just like a NATO, uh, Asian is just like NATO right now? Yeah, so ASEAN, yeah, ASEAN, that's in their, there's in their treaty, but not every country follows the treaty that they signed. So that's the question, who holds these countries accountable? And, you know, the U.S. will try to intervene and try to make it as peaceful um, as possible. But, you know, we're also having that same issue. We have a similar treaty that we signed with China where they said we're not going to steal information from businesses. And yet they're still doing it. So that's always the million dollar question. You signed this treaty. Why aren't you following what you agreed to? So I 100 percent agree with you, Boo. But um, that's always the that's always the in between the lines. <laughs> so the paper is one thing, and then outside the paper is another thing. <laughs> it's, uh, it's very difficult to control other people's mind or control other people's desire or what they want to do. It's very difficult mm -hmm. because whatever it's on the contract, it's it's one way and the other is way. We're going to take another quick break, and when we come back, we're going to um, uh, talk to you again and ask you about how can you help inspire a uh, younger generation to be successful like you, okay? So we're going to take a quick break, but we can with you some more plants and man. Welcome back to the program. Um, from what I understand, Valerie, it seems like you have went through uh, different uh, mothers, different father, I mean, different mothers, kind of like, you know. So there's a lot of kids out there that has similar situation like you, but some of them, they end up not successful in their life. So from your experience, can you tell us what, you know, others should do so that they can follow you, that way they become successful in their life, regardless of what something outside of yourself, you know, because this is something mm -hmm. happened outside of yourself, but you yourself have to focus on something in order to be successful in your life. So what can you tell us oh. about that? Um, yes, um, Boo, if you don't mind, I, I would definitely be more than happy to share my story if it's going to help other Kamai youth, if you're okay with that. Sure, definitely, yes. Um, so what's interesting about um, growing up in the Midwest is that if you 
didn't um, fit into a certain mold, if you weren't, um, didn't fit in, um, instead of just being your own person, you were kind of outcasted. And I know sometimes with particularly in like Asian families, if you weren't going into being a doctor or a lawyer, it wasn't something that was necessarily supported um, by your family and your, um, particularly your peers as well in certain situations. Um, what's interesting is, you know, I wanted to go into international affairs, which definitely does incorporate a lot of law and legal terminology, especially when you're talking about treaties. But at the time that I was studying political science, um, and this is, this is also okay too. It's okay to not know exactly what you want. Um, when you're just starting out, but you always have to keep exploring and doing that kind of like, um, I don't want to say fighting yourself, but doing that self analysis of what you like and what you don't like, um, because you don't want to be working a job day in, day out um, of it if you don't like it, unless you absolutely need to. But um, I knew that at the time, at the time I wanted to work at the United Nations, but it was before I kind of realized that I was actually really good at public diplomacy. Um, but when I was growing up, um, you know, when I was in high school, I had a normal life. But when I got to college, it was definitely it was definitely a struggle. I definitely had my fair share. You know, being half black, half Asian, I definitely wasn't really accepted by the Asian community at my university. I was definitely made fun of for being half black. And for those uh, for those Khmer, uh, my Khmer peers out there, if someone's making fun of you, just don't listen to it. Love yourself, love how you're made, love every quality about yourself, because when someone's making fun of you, they're not happy with themselves. Um, but yeah, I definitely went through a lot of racism from a lot of other Asian groups for being Cambodian. Um, and I know that Cambodians, we do I definitely do have a lot of negative stereotypes. And I've definitely experienced it when I went overseas, especially dealing with a lot of the East Asians um, as well. But that's the beauty of coming to living in the U.S. or in other countries. We have so much opportunities now, especially being a U.S. citizen that, that we can really take advantage of. We can really change the narrative and stop a a lot of the trauma that that happens in our family, um, but yeah. So there was a moment, there was a couple moments in my life that I was homeless. So I get it. It's, it's hard. Um, I worked three jobs. Sometimes I slept in my car. My family wasn't supportive. My family didn't believe in me. At the time, my friends back home left me. All I had was a dream, and. I remember, you know, I kept praying and I had a vision board of exactly what I wanted in life. I had a picture of the White House. I had a picture of the Pentagon. I had different um, pictures of where, what, where I wanted to live. And it's funny because even my fiance now, I had an idea of who I wanted to marry as far as um, just being a good person. Um, but yeah, I didn't have, you know, I really wasn't really supported by my family when it came to my career. I think I have one cousin and she's not even technically my blood cousin. She um, she got married onto my stepdad side. So I had one family member that supported me. So, but yeah, being homeless definitely taught me a lot about myself. Um, the way that I ended up getting, so after I graduated, I actually paid for my last two semesters um, at Harvard. I ended up um, asking the university um, for a loan. So one of my advice to the client kids is if you, if you think that you're at a dead end, you're actually not. It's actually an opportunity for success. So with my university, my undergraduate university, just because it wasn't advertised that there was, um, I can't think of the correct terminology of this. When there wasn't an emergency loan, it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. You have to network and find the right people to give you the resources that you need. Um, there's a lot of in hidden information out there, and a lot of times you can uncover it, but you have to talk to the right people. Um, but yeah, the way that I ended up out at Harvard, like I said, I applied, I got in, um, and even when I first became homeless, I applied to the United Nations as an intern. I didn't think I was going to get it. I didn't think I was good enough. I had people telling me how stupid I was, that I was never going to make it. And I was the underdog in my university. I was the only person of color in my program. And I worked so hard. And that's something I will tell my fellow Khmer peers, just keep working hard, keep following your dreams, because it's, it's going to pay off. 
Um, at the time, Mike Pence was still our governor in Indiana, and you can just only imagine just what we went through in Indiana. But um, my boss was the state superintendent of Indiana, so she basically ran all the schools. But my boss got voted out of office, and the Republicans didn't want to keep me. So I ended up getting fired just because I was a Republican. And the United Nations called me and they said, we would love for you to intern out there. And I don't know if any of you are aware, but United, in United Nations internships aren't paid for. So I'm thinking like, how am I gonna intern at this prestigious internship and live in New York City that rents like $3,000 a month? Um, but what ended up happening was kept working hard. I found a scholarship, um, paid for my rent three months. I definitely lived the ramen noodle diet. Um, came back home to Indianapolis, was homeless again, still trying to finish school, still working three jobs, living in my car. Um, finished, got, got into Harvard, but to get to Harvard, I literally sold everything I own just to buy a plane ticket to get out um, to the D.C. area, which, which is where I'm at right now with, with my job, and I just started over from scratch. Came to D.C., networked my way up, and it's interesting because one of my – my mentor, she was the first U.S. ambassador to ASEAN. So everything is literally possible. Don't let anyone tell you that you're not good enough, especially people that don't work in the field as well, which is always interesting. Um, because once I got into the international relations, um, like the, the field and learning the dynamics of working in this field, it's nothing like what people who are trying to tear you down was, were going were gonna to say. And sometimes you just have to find out for yourself. Yeah, that's, wow, what's a story? You know, you go from homeless to live in the car to eat ramen and you get to here now. So it's it's like a big leap for you, I, get, I think. And, and you, you, you work really, really hard, but yes, you are right. People that tell you what you cannot do, what it is is that they're the one themselves that they cannot do. It's not you mm -hmm. because they cannot they cannot know what you're capable of you know each and every one of us have different capable capability and we can do a lot of different things other people they just come in and say oh you can't do this you can't do that it happened to me all the time too you know like for example like my tv they say oh my tv is going to close in three months you know we've been here seven years now we're almost eight years already so those are the people that they are not successful themselves so they just keep go out and tell other people that you cannot mm -hmm. do it, but ignore them. What outside, what they said is what they said. What you do, what you work hard, persistent, consistent, hard work, and that's what you will get. You know, and, and uh, it, it's amazing your story. You go from, you even homeless at some time, a, two, a couple of times, right? You said a couple of times. Yes, twice. And, uh, yeah, twice, and then you now you got to Howard. Now you're never going to see that ever again. You got a good job, <laughs> right? I don't think that's that way, way yeah, behind you. Yeah, you, you have the knowledge, you got your degree, you can get any kind of job anywhere at any time with, with, the, with what you are now. And you, uh, you know, you work with the United Nations, you know, a whole bunch of other leaders. So you are already up in the ladder and, and you're going to reach your highest goal that you want to be in the future. I, I'm 100% sure that you can do that because you have your desire, you are hungry for what you want to be. And, and what you want to be is, is within reach for, for you right now. That's what I would think, you know. So, yes, thank you very much. And I think you, you have done a really, really great job and you have set a really, really good example for our younger audience out there, just in case somebody who have who happened to be in your situation, and that way they can see that you know, even those that you have that type of situation, even though you are homeless, you can still get to where you want. You know, I guess uh, one of our um, uh, one of our editor, the guy that worked for us before, he told me he also homeless too. He went to uh, learn um, how to edit video editing. 
and he was homeless and finally he got the job and he worked with other company and then he come work with us and for i think two three years after he worked with us he now he worked at the univision which is the bigger tv company you know the mexican bigger tv company station so he's he's also worked hard and persistent so that's that's where that's what make us uh you know uh where we are today you know uh we, we we work hard and we think that we can do it and not not have anyone else to direct us to teach us to tell us say oh you go this you go that so that's that's completely wrong they they said what it's not what we can do we can do a lot better we can do big time yeah okay i think we come to a, a final um times right now so do you have any last word to say to us or to anybody else um i do for my mixed race Kamai, don't let anybody tell you that you're not Kamai enough, because you are. Okay, <laughs> that's it, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much, Vanity, for coming to meet with us today, and thank you very much for show uh, telling us your story and set example for many other Cambodian out there. And um, uh, I hope that other people that uh, want your story and get inspired and uh, become successful like you, you know. Uh, like I said, it's uh, uh, more good people, it's a uh, good society, and a good country, and good planet, a good world to live in. Yeah. Thank you very much for coming on to our program today. Thank you. So, welcome to the Okay, let's see.